us today. We've got a special guest, uh, uh, Scott Vince, with us. This is a, another uh, piece of our alumni speaker series. We've got a, a lot of uh, wonderful alumni um, that have uh, left here and done, done wonderful things from, from Minot State. So um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Julio. Uh, <laughs> So, um, everybody hearing me all right? Okay. Um, it's uh, a uh, honor to uh, be here. I haven't been at um, Minot State University since about April of 1993. And uh, not May because I already had a job by then. So. Um, Maybe I was there after April, but or May. But anyway, it's nice to be here. I'm not a. Uh, I see, um, like all things in life, I always come ill prepared, and um, tend to rely on um, a quick prayer to God that I may be helpful. And um, of course, I've learned sometimes when I make that prayer that when I ask to uh, the higher power to be helpful, that sometimes being a really good speaker wasn't what he had in mind for being helpful. So um, <laughs> anyways, sorry. Um, so uh, it might take me a second to get into my groove. Um, I do tend to like more um, question and answer kind of talks, only in that uh, I'd rather talk about something you'd like to talk about rather than me babble on about something maybe you don't want to hear about. But I'm going to talk about something that was a pivot in my life. So. I, uh, I'm a poor kid, grew up poor at the trailer park, me and my mom. My mom actually went here in that minute, but, um, so I was a poor kid, and I graduated early from alternative high school, and I was working at the L&B Lucky Strike Cafe, which is the bowling alley. And, um, I had not, at that point, ever thought of college. And a friend of mine asked me what I was going to do when I got older. He says, you think about going to college. And I said, I'm not smart enough for college. I barely got through high school. And he said, he gave me context. He said, it can't be that hard. Too many people have already done it. Oh, and someone with a four-year degree, poor kid, will make a million dollars more in a lifetime. I kind of like that at that time. And he also said, now, if you wanted to be an astronaut, there's probably only about 100 of them, and they probably don't need skinny, red-haired, 130-pound guys, astronauts, that don't like flying. So, um, but his, his content gave me his perspective on looking at it differently changed the course of my life. And so I fill out the application, and um, I didn't even have to take an ACT test or whatever. But anyway, somehow I missed that. I don't know if that was. Anyway, so, but um, being a poor kid, I got a Pell Grant, and I also joined the Army, North Dakota Army National Guard. And so I got the GI Bill, and um, off I started with school. And my, 
I didn't know what I wanted to do, and so I'm one of those people that I uh, changed my major 100 times before I graduated. I have a degree in economics, and people usually look at me like I'm smarter when I say that. Um, that was the reason I have that degree is it was the only thing I could get and still be done in four years. So, because I changed from, I was, I started out as business, and then I did really well in the English class. I thought I'm going to be an English major. You know, I could see myself, you know, pipe, sweater, intellectual, right? Well, then I got a D in interary to literary criticism. Apparently, I'm a good, not a good literary critic. And so, out, lit, out English went as a major. And so, then I was on to uh, criminal justice and blah, 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 and business and marketing and jumping all over the place. Anyway, wound up with a degree in economics. Learned a lot of things at school. There's a couple of things I learned at school that I think, I learned how to learn, which you gotta know how to learn. And I learned that um, sometimes you're not learning, um, sometimes you gotta learn things fast, because I'm a last minute guy, so I tended to do everything last minute. The one thing, now when I was younger, I used to hate myself for it. However, there is, like all things, Curses can also be blessings. When you wait till the last minute, you are highly efficient. When I got a month to do a paper, it can take about a month. When I got two hours to bust out 50 pages, I'm highly effective or highly efficient because you don't have any time to, to mess around. Anyway, so. Um, but I learned a lot. I learned, uh, I met a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, which is cool. And um, I also learned that, um, that um, I learned how to job hunt. I, how I got a job, by the way, this is, uh, I, I don't share this story much, but I was worried because that um, I wasn't gonna get a job because when, you, when you're going to school, everybody always says there's no jobs. And this is also a life lesson too, by the way. And I was also thinking about maybe going to law school. And then someone said, oh, there's so many attorneys. Like, you'd never get a job. There's just, there's just no jobs. There's so many attorneys. And then someone gave me perspective. They said, there's always room for a good one. Um, and on the job hunt, I was worried and insecure. And so I, I, I would go to the placement office and on Mondays, and I would look at, they had books at that time, and I'd look at all these companies I thought it'd be cool to work for, and I would mail off 10 resumes and cover letters a week. I started that the, in like September of my senior year. And um, the first thing I realized is that maybe I was gonna start a company for rejection letters, because I, kept, I got all these rejection letters, and they would, sometimes they would send back they would edit my resume and cover letter with red marker on what I needed to do different. But anyway, um, but like all things, when you practice, you get better at it. And, um, and uh, anyway, eventually I got a job. And my first job was um, at North American Van Lines, you know, doing furniture quotes and stuff like that. And then another job landed before I got done with school, which was during the cellular boom for um, cellular One, Western Wireless, AT&T Wireless, and it was selling cell phones, and that was kind of cool. Um, big brick phones, so you'd have, you imagine a little belt clip that's got this great big brick phone on it walking into a room, and you're the only guy with one. Anyway, um, that uh, was kind of exciting, um, and that took me, uh, my first move, uh, I was doing that here in town, even before they had a cellular tower. Uh, and then uh, moved to Jamestown and uh, set up some authorized dealers and got that market going. And I ultimately had won a, an award for peak achievement where they flew me out to Bellevue and I got this award and they blah, blah, blah. What we were doing is we were, this is common practice now, but at the time it was unheard of. I, because of economics, I'd figured out the commission and bonus structure and I figured out that if and economics is about incentives of what will incentivize people to move this way or that way, et cetera, et cetera. And we were buying the cost of the phone down 100 bucks 
to get the sale. And we just destroyed it on selling cell phones, blew the commission structure away, the bonus structure away, and I won this award. They flew me out there, they gave me this peak achievement award, made all this money, and then two months later I got demoted for running an unauthorized promotion. Now, um, <laughs> that's how corporate America works, by the way. Um, the, uh, and of course they redesigned the bonus and commission structure and that took me, the, the one thing I noticed about the job is that I didn't like how competitive I was, meaning it was very competitive space and I had made some money then and I uh, uh, also had blew it, like I'd made all this bonus money and stuff and bought a nice hair, house stereo and did this and that, but at the end of the day it didn't like you know, eh, whatever. And, um, but that demotion hurt my ego and so I wound up, uh, a dealer account told me about this little company that was making tarps and pickup covers in this old schoolhouse. And it was, company was called AgriCover, which I, I owe a lot of my, I think it's important as you venture out into life to like, like not burn any bridges and be open-minded because in all of my experiences, sometimes you're getting paid to learn something even though you're not making much money at the time. I worked at Scotty's Drive-In in Bismarck when I was a kid and I learned a lot there even though he was only paying me $2.85 an hour. And uh, anyway, I got this job and I figured it, it uh, it was about 25% of the pay of what I had been making at doing the cell phone thing. However, I liked the idea of a challenge. I needed someone to set up dealers for these pickup covers they're selling. It was a little old company. And um, I started doing that. The one thing I first connected with that was it was very personable. I felt like as I, if I sold something, people at the company benefited. So I could see it right there in front of me, meaning this was benefiting people. And um, I also had the, the, the ear of the owner, and so um, I was able to do some things there to help get people benefits and all of those kind of things that seems to be commonplace now, but when I started the workforce benefits, you know, maybe you didn't always have health insurance, you didn't always have a 401k, you didn't have, always have those kind of things with a lot of companies. Anyway, that was where I began my business adventure, and I was traveling all over the United States, setting up dealers, and to get to, everybody wants to know kind of about real truck because it's a phenomenal story. Started in my basement, has grown over to over 100 million in sales. I think actually they peaked out at like 250 million, so clearly I sold a few years too soon. Um, and um, <laughs> anyway, um, so, um, but how that all tra transpired, a, a couple of learning lessons along the way is that. Um, I had a good relationship with the owner and a, a transparent relationship with him. And so he'd helped me set up my first business. It was called North, Northwest Reps. I moved out to Spokane, set up this business. We represented manufacturers. I'd eventually sell that three years later, about the time Real Truck was starting. And, um, but he'd kind of helped me do that where he let me be a salesperson for him, but sell other people's stuff. And that allowed me to um, kind of get going hardcore and being an entrepreneur and um, calling on people and et cetera, et cetera. Well, I had this idea. I didn't like doing trade shows and that's how you sold new products is you'd go to trade shows, farm shows, home guard show. And you'd, in that case, you'd roll this, pro this tunnel cover up and down all the time and you'd sell a few and you'd get a dealer going and it's like, there has to be an easier way to do this. And so I had the idea of why don't we do this and put an ad not on TV and so we did that and it had some success. Then I had a buddy who was going to school for web development. I thought, what if we take this video, because the, the prevailing thought was to sell it, you had to see it, you had to show it, people weren't gonna buy something, they couldn't feel, touch, blah, blah, blah. So we took this video and we um, set up a website with it and the very first day someone ordered it. So they bought something from Real Truck, a guy from Tennessee bought an access cover for a pickup and he'd never seen it, seen that video, blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of how, uh, in a quick nutshell, how Real Truck got going. And um, let me get my, gather my 
thought. My point in sharing that is what Real Truck actually started. I I called on truck accessory stores. I built that website or had that website built. I don't know one ounce of website code, not one. Well, I can do a little HTML. Like I could do an H1 on a page or something, but uh, that'd be about it. So uh, I learned early on that it's always good to have highly skilled people about, uh, around you. Even with Real Truck, I called back to Minot because I was out in Spokane. And the smartest kid I knew, uh, Keith Teich, who'd went to Minot State with me, and at that time he was a stock broker. I said, do you want to do my books? Because I really don't, you know, I didn't like accounting. So um, anyway, so he did my books remotely where I'd mail him all the stuff. Anyway, but that was uh, with web development, same thing. I don't know anything about web development. Got someone else to do it. But the idea, sometimes when you have a business idea, what actually comes to market will change. And what the idea behind Real Truck was is it was going to be this generic website that I would convince all of these brick and mortar stores to put their products on it and sell. And I sold about 15 different manufacturers to all of these truck accessory stores all over the Pacific Northwest and that's how I would make money the more they sold if they sold them on this website. And get this, I would give them the website for free. They just had to run it, put their name on it and run it. And what was interesting at the time was the people who had the money, had the people, had the resources, had the products, all of the things I did not have were not successful at selling online because they were busy chasing their right now business. They were concerned about their right now business. And so I would keep kind of working on real truck and it would sell a little bit more and I'd go to them and say, see, you can sell. I'm selling 10 grand a month, 20 grand a month, 30 grand a month, 40 grand a month. And, but they weren't interested. If they did to do anything, they would say, okay, I'll take your website for free. I really don't want to, but because I got better things to do. And I'm going to put the person in the company with the least amount of authority in charge of it. And everything will over, over, uh, over, uh, be more important than that website. And of course, uh, I'm making fun of it now, but, um, but of course they weren't very successful in it because they didn't really, oftentimes when you have a new idea is that you're always going to encounter uh, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, people who don't think it's, will work. I remember at the time when I first started selling, it's like nobody's going to buy a pickup cover online from a company they've ne never heard of. Then it was, well, nobody will buy a $500 pickup cover from a company that no, nobody will buy a snowplow. Nobody will spend over a thousand dollars online. Nobody will, there was always like something else that would prevent why it would be successful if that makes sense. Now, I don't think the world is set up to be against you, but one of the things I've discovered is, is oftentimes when you have an idea, here's the, here's the key with entrepreneurship. When you have an idea and you throw it out there to the world, because you're not always going to be inspired. Inspiration comes and goes. You're not, you don't sustain it. It comes and goes. So when you have inspiration, you want to act, you want to take actions, and it's almost like rowing a boat where you just, you start going, you start paddling, even if you don't have everything together, because what's going to happen is people are going to say, nobody will buy a pickup cover online, or they're going to say, they're going to give you a reason as to why it's going to be really, really hard to do. And in some cases it will stop you. And it's not that they're against you. It's that people are wired that way. When I was decided to write a book, I said, Hey, to one of my friends, I'm going to write a book about, I'm going to share the real truck story. And he said to me, but you're not an author. And I said, oh yeah, you're right. I'm not. I've really sucked at writing actually, now that you mention it. And so I didn't write it for a year. And then a year later, I was thinking about it again. I thought, boy, this story has got to be told because not that, not that I'm a good writer or anything like that, but this is just average everyday people from North Dakota created this great big business without touching a product, we didn't touch anything. It was all done online. We drop shipped everything and created a really great work culture 
and with no money, no Ivy Leaguers, no just everyday average people created this great big business that won all of these awards that it had to be sorted. But anyway, a year later, um, I was thinking about it again, and I thought it can't be that hard, too many people who write books. And what I discovered is it's actually harder to market. There's, there's a multitudes of things that go into writing, but if you're gonna write, you wanna 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 write, because what happens is you get a following, and then as you write another book, then you might grow that a little bit, and then they'll get their other book, and et cetera. But I'm not a writer, so I'm not gonna write a bunch of books. I had my experience with it, but if you're wondering what it takes to write a book, it takes four weekends, power weekends, and then it takes, uh, it takes um, another uh, four weeks or so for someone to actually turn it into something that someone can read, and then you argue back and forth a lot. Did you know when I wrote the book, this is funny, I don't even know what year I wrote the book, but when I wrote the book, I did not know this, but the editor kept, I would do a period in two spaces and the editor kept taking one of the spaces out and it was driving me crazy. And uh, I said, what, why are you taking the spaces, the two spaces out after a period? And he said, dude, two spaces after a period died when the typewriter did. And I thought, nobody's told me. <laughs> And I talked to someone that I'd worked with at Real Truck, and they said, yeah, we, we just thought it was your thing that you needed one of the two spaces. But I thought, I just, nobody informed me of the, 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 that died with the typewriter. Anyway, um, so Real Truck got going, and it was essentially, to, to uh, get to the point, it was a few years in, we're back in North Dakota, we're selling, we're about eight million and it's rocking, it's amazing. I mean, we're selling $8 million worth of stuff. Wow. And I got employees and we're killing it. And what I noticed was a couple of things. I noticed it was like, we were like, our mission statement was more. More employees, more brands, more products, more, 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 more. And it was cool that we got that, but like there had to be something more to this than just more. And um, I also noticed about culture, I had a friend who was working for pharmaceuticals and the laws changed where the pharmaceuticals, what you would do is you would take doctors like skiing and stuff like that and then they would prescribe your medication and apparently people didn't think that was cool. And so, um, they stopped allowing pharmaceutical reps to take people to fancy places, doctors and wine and dine them in Big Sky in Florida and Hawaii and that kind of stuff. And, but uh, so you were supposed to talk to doctors in the hallways, but they're too busy. Why would they want to talk to a pharmaceutical rep? They're a doctor for Christ's sake. Um, so they kind of lost their ability to talk to them about their medication and what would happen was all of these pharmaceutical reps would lie on their reports and they would send that back to the headquarters. And I thought, well, the headquarters is getting terribly inaccurate information. And, um, and my friend's honest, why are you like, you're honest in every area of your life, but why are you doing that? And it's like, well, I don't wanna lose my job. Everybody else is doing it. I'll make all the other reps look bad too. And then, I noticed at, I had an employee that uh, was on the phones and he looked at me and said, hey, uh, UPS ran over this customer's package and blah, blah, blah. Um, what should I tell him? And I thought, how interesting. He's asking me what he should tell someone. Now I could have said, well, make up a lie, jack him around and blah, 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 make his life miserable. But I said, well, do what you'd want done to you. Let's get him another apologize. Let's get him another item out. Move on, what's it? But I thought, how interesting, he's about to pivot on what I say. And then I noticed, uh, uh, anyway, so what I started to observe was that there's this culture in a workplace, just like there's culture everywhere. There's culture in this room, there's culture in the town of Minot, there's culture in, in the football team, there's culture in countries, right? There's culture in, in, not to be political, but there's culture in Trump America and there's culture in 
uh, non-Trump America or whatever. There's, I mean, there's, there's culture. An example of culture is, for those who know football, if you remember Bounty Gate, so New Orleans Saints, they were, get this, they were paying players bonuses, big bonuses, if they hurt players from other teams and took them out of games. You would get a bonus, right? Seems reasonable, right? Well, they did this for years, for years. Think about that. They wanted to win so bad, they're paying players bonuses if they hurt players on other teams. A team that they're only going to pay twice a year. And all was hunky-dory until word got out that they were doing this and they got socially shamed. And they spent millions of dollars to figure out why. Why this, how could this happen in this organization? And it came back as culture. That's how it happens. So culture will develop naturally on its own, and when it develops naturally and on its own, it tends, it tends to, in business anyway, it tends to get competitive and cutthroat. And so you can also, nur what, what we discovered at, at Real Truck is you could nurture culture. And so Jeff and I, a friend of mine, who also went to Mine State, who was uh, working as a, the Real Truck president, we had this meeting like, can we run the business on principles? Yeah, and so we, we thought of these principles and we wrote them on the wall passed them out, put them on the wall. A year later, nobody was following them. Nobody even knew what they were. So it was like, well, because we were trying to like change the culture, and yet we were totally ineffective at it. Like, nobody cares. And I'd heard about this company from Zappos, and they sold a billion dollars worth of shoes online. They had fun doing it, and they weren't the cheapest, and they sold the mostest. And I thought, that's how interesting. Except, I thought, this is a dude that sold his last company for $340 million to get into the shoe business. We're like some people from North Dakota with no money. It's like, it's a little bit different of what he's doing versus what we're doing. And I just thought maybe it's possible. And so we kind of, we started from scratch again where we, I asked the whole company, what are principles you'd want to live by? And I got all of these, all of this back from people everything how they principles they tried to live by and it was like i want to be a better me i want to keep learning i want to have a little fun i want to this da, 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 da. and so i took them all and crunched them down into six and one of them was deliver more we wanted to deliver more to our customers partners and employees in ever increasing ways kind of kill status quo because who likes being treated status quo <laughs> everybody likes to being treated special and transparency, where people wanted open and honest relationships. And in business, it's really hard to have an open and honest um, working relationship if everybody's playing poker, so to speak, if everybody's like, and so, and part of transparent, like we are also in a Facebook world in conservative North Dakota. So, and that kind of came, I remember I had a couple of teachers that worked for me in the customer service. They wanted to be teachers, but went to school to be teaching. And when I found that out, it's like, wait, I'm totally cool if you want to be teachers. I'll even help you get a teacher's job. Hint, call the principal. They're the ones who do the hiring. So um, bypass the line, um, so to speak, um, because that's how the world works sometimes. Meaning, um, what I mean by that statement is there are things you can do to make yourself stand out. If you're job hunting, send a thank you card. Because if you're second, that thank you card might get you number one now, because it shows follow-up skills, um, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I lost my train of thought. So we're, um, transparency rocks, because it's important in, in, and um, improve, meaning we wanted to embrace ongoing improvement. We wanted to always be learning, always. Always be, just because we did it that way yesterday doesn't mean we're going to do it that way today. And I give lots of examples in the book. I'm not going to get into them because I feel like I'm running out of time. Uh, the other one was, um, but it's important. We always feel better statistically when it comes to happiness. Learning actually creates happiness. And we tend to do it when we're younger and then we work our butts off. And then when you retire, you go back to learning and on wonder and you go check out the Grand Canyon and you do all of this 
stuff that creates awe and wonder, but learning creates that too, but sometimes it's not looked at that way. But uh, we always want to keep improving. We want to include fun, and it only takes a minute to add fun to something, whether it's a, uh, we would do things on the website like we sell bacon and truck accessories and we're all out of bacon. That's what people would see when they went to the front page of the website and it would create a fun memory for them. Uh, but we would do all sorts of things that were around including fun. Take risks was another one. I'm a risk taker. I've had nothing to lose, right? I've just never had anything to lose in that regard. And so I'm a big time risk taker, but most people aren't. And so I wanted to empower people to take risks, calculated risks, and then to be humble meaning we should leave it better than we found it, we should pass on credit, we should take responsibility when stuff goes sideways, et cetera, et cetera. And what happened was as we started to get those indoctrinated is that I had a company of people catching each other doing things right. I had a company of people creating fun. Accounting was giving away bean account awards where if you save the company money, you get some jelly beans and a little parade from them. And you had uh, customer service, I mean, just, all sorts of things started getting in the company. We started doing vendor awards. We started, you know, one of the things about with employees and compensation, the number one thing, number six is pay on the list that people, the feedback is. Number one is appreciation. That's the number one thing people feel they don't get enough of. So we created an environment of people catching other people doing things right. And sometimes I'd get People would tell me, hey, Scott, nobody ever shouts me out for anything. And I would say, really? How many shout outs have you done? Well, none. It's like Christmas cards, baby. If you want 50 Christmas cards, you better mail out 100. If you give praise, you will get praise. If you don't give praise, you probably won't get much praise. And so, I mean, it, it tends to be wired that way. Anyway, so. It, it just became this phenomenal place, and it was always a work in progress. Uh, I, like I said, I wrote a book about it. Um, I'm, uh, let me look at the time here. So, um, and then I, I thought my leadership shills were kind of tapped out, and so I decided to sell the company. I thought it would put it in better hands, and I thought they believed in the culture and all of those things. I had, it was an inner ex experience. I had all sorts of people flying in to look at it and that kind of thing. I told uh, employees that I was doing it and um, tried to be transparent about that. And I would often, I'll, uh, here's the value of transparency. So we were growing one time and I used to always do these what's up at Real Truck on YouTube and share out this private video to the whole company where I just kind of cover from the manager's meeting what was going on. So everybody in the company knew what was going on. But sometimes we were growing so fast, I wouldn't do that. But one day, we were going so fast, so I told someone, hey, rent the place upstairs, let's get some cubes up there, blah, 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 let's rock and roll, because we're expanding, we're growing, blah, blah, blah. Well, like a week later, someone uh, comes up to me and they're all mad. They're like, why aren't we going to get any raises for two years? It's like, what are you talking about? Well, who told you that? Well, I told Fred. So I went to Fred and I said, Fred, what's going on? Why does Jim think we're getting no raises? Well, I'm not sure exactly, but they said you were building an I Love Scott Benz office upstairs and it was cut and cost $50,000 and surely none of us are going to get raises for two years if it costs that much money. Whoa. It's interesting what, it, of course, they tracked it back and the story was one person made a guess, another person made a guess. They kept adding on to the guest and then by the time it gets back to most people, it's this hacked up story and it could all have been prevented if I would have said, hey, everybody, we're growing so fast. We got an opportunity to, to um, rent the place upstairs. We're building a bunch of cubes up there. So that's all the hammering and we're going to move some people up there and we're going to keep hiring. And that's what's going on. And instead, of course, people thought <laughs> I had rented, rent, rented the whole upstairs floor and I was building I Love Scott Benz office. It was going to be some grand thing. But anyway, that's an example of how in, in business sometimes, being transparent can help people feel like they're in the game, no matter what perspective they're looking at it, whether they're the quarterback or whether they're um, taking care of the locker room or whether they're up in the boxed 
seats or whether they're outside the parking lot um, taking tickets where it kind of connects them to the picture. Anyway, um, so I sold a uh, real truck and I, um, my experience on selling it is this, is that um, I kind of, I went through the grieving process, but believe it or not, on selling the business because they, guess what, they started running it differently than I would. How dare them? And um, they started moving jobs to Florida and, and they didn't kind of, they took the principles that which we operated by and they like shredded them um, and they just started doing everything different. And what I learned from that was if you don't nurture the culture, it will die. Real truck, when it was sold, had 99.9% .9 customer approval, business rate platinum for three years in a row, which is very hard to, to achieve. Now, of course, if you search the company that I used to own, they're lucky to have 1.5 out of 10 stars. It's really sad. But if you got money, you can keep buying the business because the new customers don't know you don't take care of the old customers. So, um, but that being said, um, that's kind of my, was my experience with it, um, where um, I thought that maybe I, my leadership shields were tacked out and that needed someone smarter, slicker, faster. And what I discovered was is sometimes when you find the smarter, slicker, faster is that they're really just interested in profit, which sometimes conflicts with how to best treat customers, employees, and uh, business partners. And so uh, my non-compete ended. And so hopefully one of these days I'll be asked to speak about uh, rhrswag.com, which was, we kind of were dabbling in racing stuff, but uh, we're back into truck accessories. We started back up in um, April. And so we're selling truck accessories. And some of the old crew uh, called me and said, hey, let's do it again. And so we're doing it again. And you say, why rhrswag.com? It's redheadedrebelswag.com was seven digits already had the domain, already had the platform. And so two months later or three or whatever it is, we're at 15 people. We're selling in truck accessories all over the continental United States. We're having a little fun doing it. We may change the name to Tracota. I have the, we just got the trademark approval for Tracota trucks, North Dakota, Tracota. Uh, and I didn't want to launch with that because I wasn't sure if Toyota would sue us or something or say you couldn't do that, but they didn't have any issues with it. So uh, it might be rebranded re re to that, but that's been exciting kind of, it reminded me when I was teaching uh, students at the university when I was teaching digital marketing, it really made me feel young because there's part of youth is there's just, there's this zeal about youth. You don't always have the experience, but there's zeal of it. And so a couple of entrepreneurial lessons that I'll share is that um, don't give up too soon because it's, al it's always going to get tough. It'll get tough. And mainly because um, that's how it is. It just gets tough. And oftentimes when you go to people for help, they will tell you why you can't do something. One of my favorite things I sling around all the time to make things happen is this. I say this. You guys can probably think of a better one, but I say, we put a man on the moon on the, in 1969. 1969 we did this. What we're doing here ain't that hard. Now, of course, if I was working for a rocket company, I might say something different than that, but that might not fly. But for a lot of things we're doing, it's more of, about perspective and opportunity and hanging in there because again, oftentimes, anything, any new idea, oftentimes it will be rejected and it will oft, often, your final product will not look like what you started with. Case in point, real truck did not start how it ended. If you look at Airbnb, Airbnb was some college students wanting to find cheap places they could stay. And now Airbnb is the number one place, number one hotel company in the world, but really you rent experiences from them. You can rent a castle on Airbnb. If you look at lots of companies from what they start, even if MSU, here now is evolving a little bit where you've got in classroom and then a little bit of remote action going on and where it's evolving, where oftentimes things always evolve. And I think, um, anyway, um, 
the People always ask me oftentimes about career advice on what they should do. My best advice is this for careers. Follow your passion. If you follow your passion, you will figure out a way to make enough money to do your passion. If you follow the money, you probably won't enjoy it. Because the one thing that research knows about money is it doesn't, money does not affect happiness. It only affects happiness in so much as what you do with what you have. So if you have money and you use it to go have a cup of coffee with a friend whom you enjoy chatting with, that will create more emotional long-term happiness than buying a flat screen TV, a bigger one. So my point is, is that um, it doesn't matter so much how much you have, it matters what you do with what you do have. So if you do things with your money to create memorable experiences, it will help with your baseline happiness. But if you use your money to buy more flat screens and bigger houses, it probably won't. Uh, and oftentimes people, um, so one of the things that happened along the way was UPS, featured me in national ads, air guitar and a billet grill, and they also flew me to uh, Italy, and me and some other e-commerce people drove Ferraris at the Ferrari plant and ate dinner and all of that kind of stuff and did some cool things. And the one thing nice about driving a Ferrari is it means you don't ever have to buy one because it's just another car. Um, not that... Uh, I do uh, like driving my Porsche, but you know what? My daughter bought a Subaru Crosstrek, and I drove it one time, and I thought, this drives as nice as my Porsche, and it's only 20 grand, 25 grand. She got a better deal. Anyway, um, not that those experiences aren't fun, um, uh, that along the half, some of, that you, some of the experiences that you have along the way um, of just the business journey and all of that, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, and uh, there's lots of good people to learn through. And I think uh, the biggest thing for me was kind of finding my lane. I'm, I'm good at kind of pattern. I see patterns and I'm good at certain things, but I suck at a lot of other things. And the one thing I know is that you want to get people around you that are good at the things that you're not good at. And uh, to kind of um, uh, assist with that, because I always thought like sometimes when you see leaders that uh, they're always great at everything and blah, 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 but that's not the case. And oftentimes they've had great struggles, and so they're known for, they're known for um, their successes. But everybody's had failures. Everybody has failures along the way. Everybody, everybody has had failures along the way. You just don't remember them. You don't remember the dude who sank the Titanic because he was a failure, John Smith. Yet everybody knows who Lindenberg is, Spirit of St. Louis. You know, and that's because people tend to remember failure or success, I mean, more so over failure. And so my point is, nobody knows about Cellular World that I used to own because it failed. Nobody knows about, nobody knows about, so to speak, all of these things that didn't pan out. Because even within a business, even within a business, you have many failures all the time. And the difference between success and failure, I think, sometimes is persistence. Sometimes I'm, I'm insane, insanely determined where other people quit before whatever needed to happen happens because they get kind of tapped out. One thing I learned when I went to Minot State, I wasn't much of a runner, but I had friends that were runners and I would run with them. Not because I'm a runner, because I liked hanging with my friends. Personally, I'm not a runner. I think running's a lot of work. But anyway, um, what I learned on those runs is that my mind would give out way before my body would give out. My mind would want to give out way before my body would give out. And I think a lot of things with in entrepreneurship and business is wired that way where, where our mind tends to quit on us before our mind tends to quit on us. And that's kind of sometimes our greatest, uh, our greatest uh, weakness is the confines of our own mind and kind of overcoming our own self-doubt and I think how you overcome yourself, doubt is perspective. 
and so sometimes we lose perspective on things. Anyway, I feel like my boat is taking on water, um, and so I'm going to button her up. Um, I do appreciate being here. If you do have any questions or whatever, I'd be happy to answer them. Again, I tend to be a little bit better question and answer talker than I do uh, just a talker talker. So um, anyway, thank you. If you do have a question, please raise your hand so we can use the microphone when we're recording. Hello, my name is Brenna. I go to Ryan State here. I'm a business major. And what are some things that your businesses have done to give back to your community or the state or any sort of giving back initiative? Um, so part of like when, when I was at, uh, in, right now I have storage facilities, RH Rebel Storage, um, and in that case we donate some of the storage units to various charities either to keep their stuff or to, um, or to auction it off to raise money for someone or they can have free rent for a month or for a year, excuse me. But in the real truck days we tended to do uh, we would do a charity of the month where we would uh, let all the employees pick one and then we would raise money for it and then the company would match everything that was raised and we would give it to the charity and that was, uh, I like that method best because it was kind of a way of like everybody participating and then um, it kind of spreading the love around. I've also done, uh, for those of you who've read my book, I do have a bad habit sometimes of racing uh, a dirt track race car. And so I have uh, sold those and given the money to charity. One of my favorites is the Ann Carlson Center in Jamestown because they kind of help uh, special needs kids. I'm not sure if I'm describing that correctly, but they, they, they help kids with challenges, some that are full-time and live there and some that come there on a part-time basis. Um, but that's some of the uh, ways that we've uh, done it. I may, with RHR Swag, I'm planning on, we're, gonna, we're thinking about launching a, a YouTube um, show where we bring some people together and we argue about how to build a truck and what truck and what to put on it and we argue all the way through the show and we build this kick butt truck and then we auction it off and give the money to charity is the plan behind it. Now we haven't done it yet uh, but it's still in the tentative plans but that's the plan. Welcome. Any other uh, questions? It could be about anything. I'll tell you if I won't answer it. One, kid, one time I spoke and a kid wanted to know what my net worth, net worth was, so I didn't answer that question, but I don't know uh, what my net, net worth is. Uh, it doesn't really matter per se. Money only matters in that you need enough of it to survive and obviously if I went and filled up my cart at the grocery store and walked by the till and said money doesn't matter and I kept pushing it, I'd probably get arrested. But um, so it's nice to have enough, um, but I think sometimes uh, people, some people have too much. So, um, yeah. Scott, um, so you said your non-compete is over or was over this yep. past spring. Um, what, what do you think you'll, you'll do here going forward um, in the next few years? Well, I'm not uh, sure exactly. I mean, we're trying to... What I want to do is get the kind of the management team in place, get things rocking, get the web going, get sales going, which, which we're doing. Um, and then the kind of the longer term plan is, is it'll probably take, I'm 49, and so um, I sold real truck because I, I kind of didn't want to work as hard as I'm working right now, but at the same token, I'm not wired to sit around and do carpentry projects or something. I'm just not wired that way to sit so long. But the plan is to get the management uh, team in place and then kind of what I wanted to do is kind of evolve it into being an employee-owned company and then they can be the uh, determiners of their destiny rather than um, some rich people that live in a different world than their employees. And so that was the kind of the long-term thinking. And we want to we wanna really take care of customers. We really want to like the mission that Real Truck used to be on was we want to make people's lives and vehicles better and we want to try to do that in any possible way that we can and kind of keep kind of pushing the needle a little bit. And so uh, even um, 
And so that's kind of the tentative plan. Who knows what? It is a little more competitive. It is a little more, um, there's a few more challenges um, than what there were. And uh, so we'll see where it goes. But um, I think uh, uh, this month, I think we'll do 300 grand in sales. So I'm a little rusty, um, <laughs> if that makes sense. But it costs, the margins are thinner. And of course, we drop ship everything and we don't really have the platform. So that's all being built as fast. And, you know, so like even uh, yesterday, I hired someone and sent them a bunch of emails and talked to them briefly on the way here. And so it's kind of, we're just going 100 miles an hour. So um, it's exciting, but uh, at the same token, uh, we don't know what we're doing. And so that ain't all bad. So, um, hmm. Any uh, other questions for, um, yeah, um, we call her good, so. All right, any more questions? Thank you, Scott, for joining us today.